is John Daly in the Salem Court of Massachusetts Bay Province. The recess in the witchcraft trial of 71-year-old Rebecca Norse, which started at 10 o'clock in the morning of this 29th day of June, 1692, is just about over and the trial should soon resume. As you know, Rebecca Norse, great-grandmother and mother of eight, whose husband owns a 300-acre farm not far from the Crane River Bridge, went on trial this morning as a witch. The penalty for witchcraft is death. This courthouse on Townhouse Lane is jammed to the rafters. And Salem, Massachusetts, June 1692. CBS is there. A Salem court tries a woman as a witch. CBS invites you to believe that our microphone is there waiting for the verdict. All things are as they were then, except for one thing. CBS is there. This broadcast, the fourth in a special summer series produced and directed for Columbia by Robert Lewis Sheon, is based on authentic historical fact and quotation. And now, Salem, June 29, 1692, and John Daly. We'll tell them how this trial is progressing. The tension with which this day opened here in Salem has grown greater, if possible. In this trial, second in the biggest roundup of suspects these colonies have ever seen, two key witnesses for the prosecution this morning testified that the defendant, Rebecca Norse, was responsible for fits, seizures, and the unnatural torment which had been plaguing a dozen or so Salem girls for the last few months. Another woman named by these girls, Bridget Bishop, has already been hanged and waiting in jail at this very moment to be tried by this same court on these same charges of witchcraft are 150 local residents who were seized in their homes in nearby Lynn, Topsfield, Marblehead, Amesbury, Andover, Wells, as well as Salem, and as far off as Boston. This morning, a prosecution witness, the Reverend Mr. Samuel Paris, minister of Salem Village, testified that the alleged unnatural activities of Rebecca Norse against the afflicted children are actually part of a much larger plot against the government. Is that correct, Mr. Paris? If that plot had not been discovered, the plotters would soon have succeeded in sinking this government. On the stand this morning, Mr. Paris, you spoke of proof. They have been holding meetings, sir. They have been holding meetings and plotting to root out the Christian religion from this country. I see. You said, too, that they were prepared to blow up all the churches and wreck our government. And set up instead their own diabolism. So, well, I'm told, sir, that before you came to this church, you were a merchant in the Barbados Isles. I gave up commerce for the ministry. You brought back with you some slaves, sir. Two. Is it true, Mr. Paris, that there has been a dispute going on between you and members of your congregation as to what were the terms of your salary agreed upon two and a half years ago? When I accepted the call to this parish two years and seven months ago, my salary was clearly determined. But there is a dispute, isn't there, as to whether it gives you permanent ownership of the parsonage or merely the use of the ministry and the pasture. The salary for my services includes full and permanent ownership of the parsonage and surrounding grounds. Those who have disputed it are simply not in possession of the facts. I see, but is the prisoner's husband, is Francis Norse, among those who have disputed your claim to permanent ownership, Mr. Francis Harris? Francis Norse is not in possession of the facts. Just one more question, Mr. Paris. About the committee charged with furnishing you with firewood last November, when you tried to have them brought to law... The committee had stubbornly and for a long time been derelict in its duty to furnish the parsonage with firewood. But it was argued then that an extra sum had been added to your annual salary to compensate you for finding your own firewood. But that's Mr. Somebody... Paris, Rebecca Norse's husband, the husband of the woman against whom you testified this morning is on the firewood committee, is he not? Rebecca Norse has been plotting the destruction of our government. Thank you very much, yeah. Reverend Samuel Paris. Also on the stand this morning, we heard Dr. William Griggs, village physician, testify that a number of his patients had been bewitched. Dr. Griggs, you said that you yourself had seen evidence of their unnatural affliction. I saw the ministers, the Reverend Mr. Paris's own niece, try to fly up the chimney. You described how she was picked up by an unseen force. An unseen force hurled her through the room so that she flew from wall to wall. Then she began to show every evidence of starting to fly, stretching up her arms as high as she could and crying, wish, wish, wish. This morning, Dr. Griggs, you testified that the girls were under the baleful influence of an evil eye. Now, speaking as a medical man, what is the explanation of the evil eye? 
When a witch turns her evil eye on a subject, an invisible and impalpable fluid darts from the eye of the witch and penetrates the brain of the bewitched. From then on, the witch can do with the bewitched as she pleases. Thank you, Dr. Griggs. The excitement over the witches brings to a head the anxiety and unrest which has been disturbing these people of Salem. Dissatisfaction with a succession of governors, high taxes, a high cost of living, and lately rumors of war make it easy to understand why the distracted Salemites feel, as one put it to me this morning, that Satan is loose in New England, and why they're not surprised to learn that 150 of their own neighbors and even friends have been plotting with the devil against them and their government. The judges are coming in now. Judges Sewell, Sargent, Winthrop, Richards of Boston, Corwin and Gedney of Salem. And here comes the deputy governor, the Honorable William Stoughton, who has been acting as chief justice during the trial. This is the sign that the recess is over, the prisoner is about to be brought in, and the trial resumed. The crowd grows quiet. Attorney General Thomas Newton has walked over to say something to Deputy Governor Stoughton. Here she and, comes. Oh, here she comes. Here comes Rebecca North, accused witch. She's flanked by George Herrick on the right, another constable on the left. Her husband is standing up. Francis North is waving to his wife, trying to get her attention, but the elderly prisoner seems to be either too indifferent or too tired to Mother! look up. That was her daughter's voice. The voice you heard was Sarah North's, the defendant's 28-year-old daughter. She called out Mother, and her mother seems to have heard her. She raises her head. She looks a little bewildered. Judge Stoughton is pounding on the desk for order. The trial is about to start. In the front row, the afflicted girls, Ann Putnam and Abigail Williams, who are here to testify against Rebecca Norsa staring at her. The marshal helps the prisoner to the platform where she stood this morning. Apparently, Rebecca Norse is still not going to sit. She's going to stand through this session. She's standing about eight feet from the judges now, facing the judges. Oh, Attorney Will General you, Newton has opened the trial, and he tells Rebecca you Norse, you are now in the hands of authority. I adjure you to answer the questions of the court truthfully and not to lie. He warns her not to lie, and now I'll throw open the microphone on the witness stand and let you hear the proceedings. Rebecca Norse, why do you hurt these children? I do not hurt them. If you are guilty of this fact, do you think you can hide it? The Lord knows. And Putnam, have you seen this woman hurt you? Yes, she beat me last night. Despite the fact that Rebecca Norse was locked in the Salem jail last night, 12-year-old Ann Putnam accuses her of having beaten her in her own home, thereby implying that Rebecca Norse can be in two places at once and is therefore a witch. Abigail Williams, have you been hurt by this woman? Yes. Now, Rebecca Norse, here are two. Ann Putnam, the child, and Abigail Williams, who complain of your hurting them. What do you say to it? I do not hurt them. This morning you heard read the confession of one Abigail Hobbs, confessed witch. She named you as the queen of a witch's feast. What do you say to it? How could she say that? She is one of us. What do you mean by that? By what? What do you mean by one of us? She is like the rest of us, innocently imprisoned. Didn't you say you would tell the truth? Who hurts these children now? Look upon them. May I go to prayer? We have not sent for you to go to prayer. Why did you stop coming to church when the girls were seized with fits? It made me ill. Why didn't you visit them in their affliction the way the other neighbors did? I was not able to go out of doors because of illness. What sir. sort of illness? I suffer from weakness of the stomach, sir. <coughs> There's a man! What's bringing her here? What did he say to you? We mustn't believe everything these distracted children say. There's no one whispering in the ear. You dare to lie before this whole assembly. You are now before authority. I expect the truth. What did the man whisper in your ear? I ask anyone here to tell me they saw anyone beside me. You can see I am all alone. Let's go to the sacrament, David. They do not be there. <laughs> there has been talk among your neighbors, Rebecca Noss, that your illness is of a supernatural character. What do you say to that? I've had difficult times, sir. I am the mother of eight children, and I suffer with the weakness that any woman would, my age and condition. Do you have any wounds? Uh, Attorney yes, General yes, Newton sir, has asked the defendant the perhaps the most dangerous question of all so far. Do you have any wounds? Referring to those marks found on the person of a witch which betray that she is in league with Satan, but Rebecca Norse being slightly doof, deaf, he has to repeat the question, do you have any wounds? 
I have none but old age, she answers. 71-year-old Rebecca Norse is beginning to tire. Her white hair, somewhat disheveled, is clinging to her forehead. She's wringing her hands, nervously clasping and... Something strange is happening. 12-year-old Ann Putnam is screaming. She is pinching. She is pinching. And now Abigail Williams is screaming. She is choking me. Both of these girls seem to be having some kind of a spasm. They're rising on the floor, clutching at their throats and crying that Rebecca Norse is choking them. Deputy Marshal Herrick and another constable have run over and are each holding one of the prisoner's hands to keep her from pinching and choking the girls who are at least ten feet away from her. They're now manicuring her hands behind her back. The turmoil is dying down. The spectators are taking their seats. Attorney General Newton again turns to the prisoner who seems visibly... You see, Rebecca Doss, what a great condition these girls are in. Why do you hurt them? I I do not hurt them. When your hands are freed, the girls are pinched and choked. May I sit down? Do not feel well. You are strong enough, Rebecca Doss, to bewitch these girls. You are strong enough to stand at your trial. Do you think these girls suffer voluntarily or involuntarily? What do you say, Rebecca Noss? Do these girls suffer voluntarily or involuntarily? The court is not able to hear you. May may my husband come up to wipe me for it. Sweat from me for it. My hands are bound. These girls charge you with hurting them. If you think they suffer involuntarily, then you admit that what they say is true. And if you think they suffer not willingly, then you are calling them murderers. Which do you say, Rebecca Noss? I do not mean to call them murderers. I, I don't know what to make of their conduct. Answer the question, Rebecca Noss. Do you think these girls suffer against their will or not? I do not think they suffer against their will. Rebecca Norse is showing extraordinary courage. Old, alone, pitted against men of superior education and legal training with no lawyer to defend her, she nevertheless sticks to her point that the girl's fits are not involuntary. Now Ann Putnam's mother, Mrs. Thomas Putnam, takes the stand. Tell the court what happened. One morning, Rebecca North came to me. What time was it? It was very early morning. Just as it grew light. She was still in her nightgown. She came to me. And she brought a little red book in her hand. She tried to make you sign it? She said if I wouldn't, she would tear my soul out of my body. What? Then Then there appeared to me six children in winding sheets. And they called me out. Who are these children? They told me they were the children of my sister Baker, who lived in Boston. And they said that Rebecca North had murdered them. And they told me to go and tell it to the magistrate or they would tear me to pieces. The testimony piling up against Rebecca North yes, has become Sarah more Pepper. serious if possible. And now another neighbor of the accused, Sarah Pepper, a widow, takes the stand. Now, without fear, will you tell the court, Sarah Pepper... Whether anything ever took place between the prisoner and any member of your family? Yes, sir. Uh, About this time, three years ago, my dear husband, Benjamin Pepper, now dead, may the Lord bless his soul, was as well as I ever knew him in my life. Yes, yes. Uh, go on, please. Uh, He was healthy and happy till one Sunday morning, Rebecca Norse. The same Rebecca Norse who now stands charged with witchcraft? The same Rebecca Norse who now stands charged with witchcraft. Uh, What did she do? She came to our house and fell to scolding and railing at him because our pigs had gotten into her fields. Uh, Your fields are close together? Yes, sir. And we're only supposed to keep half the fence mended. It's up to her to mend the other half. That was the agreement. Uh, What happened then? Her 
her side of the fence was down and our pigs got through. We told her we'd kept those pigs hobbled, but there wasn't a thing you could say to quiet her down. She railed and scolded, calling on her son Benjamin to go and get a gun and kill the pig. How did your husband answer her? My poor husband never said one word amiss to her. And it was right after that he was taken with a fit. Was his seizure the same kind as the afflicted girls have been having? His seizure was the same kind as the afflicted girls have been having. Did your husband have any seizures after that? My poor husband was never the same again. The day before he died, he talked very cheerful. But he was seized at midnight. And this fit lasted till the next night. And then he died. <laughs> That is all, Miss Sarah Pepper. The deputy marshal is leading the weeping widow Pepper back to her seat, and Attorney General Newton turns to confer with the seven judges behind him. This looks bad for the defendant. So far, all of the testimony... Wait a minute. A young man is coming towards the judge's bench. It's Samuel North, the prisoner's son. The sheriff challenges him. speak. If you have any evidence to present, Samuel Noss, present it at the proper time. This is the proper time, and I ask leave of the court to present my evidence. Tell your story. On the 27th of March, I and my sister's husband, John Tarbell, he's here now and he'll swear to everything I say. Tell your story. John and I went up to Thomas Putnam's to find out why his wife and daughter were making shocking accusations against my mother. The reason why is no secret. You heard them tell the court. I wanted them to tell me. At the house, I found Miss Putnam, her daughter Anne, and one of Anne's friends. I asked young Anne how she came to name my mother among the witches. I said, did she mention my mother's name first, or did someone else say it to her? What point are you trying to make? When I ask young Anne how she first came to mention my mother's name among the witches, she replied that she had seen the apparition of a pale-faced woman sitting in her grandmother's chair. I said, who was that woman? She said she didn't know her name. I said, who told you to say my mother's name? Are you saying that? That's when her friend spoke up. Why, Anne, don't you remember? She said it was your mother. That made Miss Putnam very angry. She cried why it was not. It was you who told her to say Rebecca Norse. Then they turned on each other and they said it was you. It was you who told her to say the name. I still don't understand the point you are trying to make, Samuel Norse. What I'm trying to say is that not one of those who now accuse my mother would admit it was they first named her among the witches. First or last, they named her. Take your Attorney seat. General Newton seems to be a little impatient as he motions Samuel Norse to return to his seat. His sister has risen. The Norse family seems to be on the attack now in defense of their mother. Sarah Norse, the defendant's 28-year-old daughter, without being asked, without permission, has come up and is now standing before the bench. Attorney General Newton ignores her. He's conferring with the judges. Rebecca Norse is looking at her daughter. She's smiling, a strange, vague smile. Now Attorney General Newton has turned to Sarah North. He's taking her testimony. I was in the meeting house on the 24th of March, the day the committee first examined my mother. I was there when Miss Bibber... You are referring to the widow, Bibber, who lives in Wenham? That's the one. I was there when she went into a fit. The court knows that. I was watching her when she began to scream that my mother was sticking her with pins. You're adding nothing new to the fact, Sarah North. If that is why you have asked for permission to testify... But I saw Miss Bibber take the pins out of her clothes. I saw her take the pins out of her clothes. That's all right. I saw Miss Bibber take some pins out of her clothes and hold them between her fingers. Then I saw her clasp her hands around her knees. And that's when she began to scream that my mother was sticking pins in that's her. That's a lie. You're a liar. You're a liar. One of the spectators He's probably sees Mrs. He's Bibber lying. screaming that's a lie. She's a liar. Sarah Norris is answering and shouting it's the truth and you know it. The marshal is making her go back to her seat. Come on down and take your seat. I would like to speak. Benjamin Putnam is asking to come testify. Forward. The attorney general is inviting him to come forward. Is asking the brother-in-law of Mrs. Thomas Putnam, who testified against Rebecca North just a minute ago, to come forward. I have a paper here, signed by 39 people of Salem and Salem Village. I ask the court's permission to read it. You may read it. We, whose name... Uh, will you read it a little louder? <coughs> We whose names are hereunto subscribed, being desired by Francis Norse to declare what we know concerning his wife's conversation for some time past, can testify to all whom it may concern that we have known her for many years. And according to our observation, 
Her life and conversation were as she claimed it. And we never had any cause or grounds to suspect her of any such thing as she is now accused of. Signed, Benjamin Putnam, Sarah Putnam, Job Swinnerton, Esther Swinnerton, Samuel Abbey, Hepzibah Ray, Daniel Andrews... This is a surprise. 39 of Rebecca Norse's neighbors, including Anne Putnam's own brother-in-law, testified by petition to their belief in Rebecca Norse's innocence. Rebecca Norse seems stunned by this unexpected turn in her favor. The spectators, too, seem visibly impressed by the long list of responsible and respectable names. Mrs. Putnam looks startled. She keeps brushing her hair out of her eyes. Her face is pale. Judge Stoughton is turning to the jury. And... Rebecca Norse! Didn't you bring the devil with you? Rebecca Norse, you are the devil's wife. Mrs. Putnam, she's screaming, how often have you eaten and drunk your own damnation? She's hysterical, she's becoming violent, she's ripping her clothes. Her husband has received the court's permission to take her outside and he's lifted her bodily. He's carrying out, kicking and screaming out of the courtroom and has taken her out now. The trial can start again. Rebecca North seems to be on the point of fainting. It doesn't look as if she can keep standing on her feet much longer. Once again, Judge Stoughton... Wait a minute, something else has happened. A woman among the spectators threw her shoe and hit Rebecca North in the face. There's a red streak on Rebecca North's right temple where Mrs. Pope's shoe hit her. Rebecca North looks white and shaken. The courtroom is quieting down. Judge Stoughton turns to the jury. Apparently, there's going to be no more testimony. He's going to send out the jury for a verdict right now. I charge that you, being the judges of the facts, if you find that Rebecca North did bewitch the said girls, Anne Putnam and Abigail Williams, so that they were sore afflicted and tormented, then you must find her guilty of witchcraft under the statute of James the First. The jury has risen now and is filing out of this courtroom to consider the verdict. The judges are leaving too, and Deputy Marshal Herrick is taking Rebecca North from the courtroom. Some of the spectators are leaving for a breath of fresh air. The jury is out of the courtroom now. Of course, there's no possible way of knowing how long they will be. They may return momentarily, and if they do, we will switch back here to the courtroom immediately. Meantime, there are about 150 other suspects, as we told you, who have been rounded up in this drive and who are now in nearby jails waiting to be tried by this same court. My colleagues Harry Marble and Ken Roberts are at this moment in two of those prisons, Boston and Ipswich, with CBS microphones, and we switch you first to Harry Marble in Boston Prison. This is Harry Marble in Boston Prison. I'm standing in a room about 25 by 35 and 7 feet high. The walls are of stone and the windows are barred. Leaning against the walls and chained to the benches here are about 25 or 30 men who are waiting to be tried for witchcraft. Right beside me, his hands manacled, is Navy Captain John Alden. Captain Alden, what are the specific charges against you? Witchcraft, I presume. You have to pay your own room and board while you're in prison, don't you, Captain? Yes. And should I have the misfortune to be found guilty, my family would have to pay the cost of my execution. And, of course, my property would immediately be confiscated by the authorities. The deputy governor, I imagine. I am told that some of your fellow prisoners confess to practicing witchcraft, Captain. I will tell you how one confessed. A boy of about 18. They had him tied neck and heels until blood flowed from his mouth and nose. He confessed. One more question, Captain Alden. Are you by any chance related to the John Alden who married Priscilla Mullen? That was my father, sir. My parents met on the Mayflower coming over from the other side. Thank you, Captain John Alden. This is Harry Marble in Boston Prison. I now switch you to Ken Roberts in Ipswich Jail. This is Ken Roberts in Ipswich. The jail here is crowded with women of all ages. Beside me here is the prisoner Dorcas Good, accused witch. How old are you, Dorcas? I'm four years old. Four-year-old Dorcas Good was arrested the same day as Rebecca Norse. I'm four, going on five. Dorcas just corrected her age. She is four, going on five. Why are you here, Dorcas? I want a piece of bread with honey. Do you know why they put you here, Dorcas? My name is Dorcas Good, and I am four years old, going on five. 
chained beside four-year-old Dorcas here is Mrs. Rebecca Jacobs of Salem Town. Why have they put you in prison, Mrs. Jacobs? They ran in the street. They ran in the street, and I said, look at the children. They are running in the street. Mrs. Jacobs. Then the men said, these are your children. They are running after you. Tell them to go back. Your children saw you arrested, Mrs. Jacobs? Come home, Mother. Mother, come home. I want my children. I want my children. I want my mother. Do you get enough to eat here, Mrs. Jacobs? Children, don't cry. Mother will be home. The nice men are just taking your mother for a walk. Mrs. Jacobs, have your children been allowed to visit you? Black roots and windflowers, sweet Mary and lilacs, they grow in my garden. When night comes, they close their eyes and go to sleep. I want my children. I want my baby. I want a slice of bread and honey. Well, I'm sorry, Mrs. Jacobs, but a message has just been handed to me. The jury trying Rebecca North has just come back into the courtroom. So this is Ken Roberts returning you to John Daly in Salem. <laughs> this is John Daly in the Salem courtroom. The jury has come back. The jury charged with the fate of Rebecca Norse has just returned. The judges are in their places. The prisoner, her hand still manacled, stands facing the bar. The spectators are silent, waiting. The jurymen have taken their seats, all except Thomas Fisk, the foreman. The foreman is standing, and now Judge Stoughton turns to the jury. Have you reached a verdict? We have. What have you found? We find the defendant not guilty. Not guilty. The jury has found Rebecca North not guilty. She looks stunned and stands bewildered and confused, pale and shaken. Her husband is fighting his way up to her. 72-year-old Francis North is crying, and his wife, Rebecca North, is now in his arms. Rebecca North, her gray head sunk on his shoulder, is crying for the first time since this trial began. Her sons and daughters are kissing and hugging her. They're all trying to touch her. They're patting her face, her hair, her dress, and they're laughing, and at the same time, tears are streaming down their cheeks. <clears throat> now Judge Stoughton has left the bench and is talking with Thomas Fisk, the foreman of the jury. George Herrick, the deputy marshal, is pushing his way through to Rebecca North, probably to tell her that he's glad she was acquitted. The deputy marshal is saying something to Rebecca North now, and for some reason or the other, he's taking her by the shoulder. And now the jury is going out again, and Sam North has run over to the deputy governor. He seems to be having a heated argument with Judge Stoughton. I'm going to get over there to find out what's going on. There's something going on. There's a great deal of confusion all around here. I this to my mother. I did not impose on the jury. I've merely given them a fact which they had overlooked. Mr. North, Mr. North, what has happened? They're making the jury convict my mother. The jury comes back with a verdict of not guilty, and Stoughton sends them out again. They come back, and he tells them that they have misinterpreted the facts. They have my mother on the stand, and they tell her Abigail Hobbs said she was a witch. And she says, how could Abigail say that? She is one of us. Now the judge says that when my mother said she's one of us, she admitted she was a witch too. But he heard my mother say she didn't mean that. She meant Miss Hobbs was just one of the prisoners. Why, what Stoughton's done is tell the jury to hang her. But why? Why should Judge Stoughton do this? Because they've got some people in office around here who are scared of being pushed out. There are too many people who don't like them. So they find themselves some scapegoats. They take women like my mother. They say she's a witch. They say they're trying to bewitch our children and sink the government. All they're trying to do is save their own necks, and for that they're going to hang my mother. Sam North is angry, frenzied. He seems to be absolutely sure the jury will change its verdict. I've never seen anything like this happen in a courtroom before, and it's hard to believe. But we'll, we'll see. The jury is coming back already. They've only been out a short while. With Tom Fisk leading them, they're coming back into the jury box. Their faces are grave. Judge Stoughton is banging his gavel for order and has turned down to jury foreman Thomas Fisk. Have you reached a verdict? We have. What is your verdict? We find Rebecca North guilty as charged. Mother! Mother! Rebecca Mother! North has been found guilty. What Sam North feared has happened. Everything he said was apparently true. And if this is contempt of this court, let it be so. A woman adjudged innocent by a jury of her peers by almost precise direction of a presiding judge, has been found guilty and now must pay the supreme penalty. This... Salem, June 29, 1692. Rebecca Norse is guilty and the witch hunt goes on. You have been listening to CBS Is There, the fourth in a special summer series of broadcasts of famous events. Next week, July 29, 1588, the English Channel... Sir Francis Drake defeats the Spanish Armada. 
CBS is there. CBS is there is produced and directed for Columbia by Robert Louis Shayon. The Salem Witch Trial was written by Sylvia Berger. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.